Part 2 of King George, What Was His Problem? by Steve Schenken. A sleepless night before revolution. What are you waiting for, Thomas Gage? That was basically the message from London. King George wanted action. He wanted General Gage to march his soldiers out of Boston and seize the military supplies that were being stored by local militias. He wanted patriot troublemakers like Samuel Adams and John Hancock arrested and shipped to London in chains. Orders are orders. Tensions in Boston were at record levels in the spring of 1775. General Gage was so worried about another Boston massacre type incident, he refused to allow his soldiers to carry their pistols in the street. For this sound judgment, the soldiers called Gage the old woman. Meanwhile, in the towns around Boston, thousands of militia members were just waiting for the British soldiers to make a move. Some militia even called themselves Minutemen because they could be called together at a minute's notice, or pretty quickly anyway. Gage was sitting on a time bomb and everyone could hear the ticking, but orders are orders. The general considered his options. He knew that the local militias were storing their weapons in Concord, a town just 17 miles north of Boston. And he knew that Samuel Adams and John Hanks were la lying low at a house in Lexington. Interesting. So Gage came up with a plan. He'd send 700 British soldiers out to Lexington and Concord. They could try to grab Adams and Hancock in Lexington. Then they could march onto Concord and destroy the military supplies there. That should make the king happy, right? Don't open that envelope. During the afternoon of April 18, 1775, Gage sat down at his desk and wrote out orders for the mission. He sealed the plan in an envelope without showing it to anyone. He gave the envelope to Colonel Francis Smith, who was to lead the expedition. He told Smith to have his soldiers assemble on Boston Common by the Charles River at exactly 10 o'clock that night. He ordered Smith not to open the envelope with the plan until then. Why would Gage keep the plan secret from the man who was going to lead the mission? Gage knew that it was going to be very dangerous for his soldiers to march out into the hostile territory around Boston. His hope was to keep the march secret until the very last second. Then his soldiers just might be able to get out to Concord and back before the Minutemen, Minutemen had time to react. Would Gage be able to keep the plan a secret? Listen to this. At about 9 o'clock that night, Gage called his pal, General Hugh Percy, into his office and told him the plan. He told Percy that no one else knew of the plan yet. Minutes later, Percy left Gage's house and walked out on into Boston Common. He saw that British soldiers were quietly gathering down by the water as planned, and he saw small groups of people, nosy Bostonians, standing around watching the action. He snuck up to one group, his face hidden by shadows. Percy joined the conversation. conversations, a Bostonian. British troops have marched but we'll miss their aim. Percy, what aim? Bostonian, why? The cannon at Concord. So the secret was already out, even before the British soldiers themselves knew where they were going. Percy rushed back to Gage's office and told him the bad news. Everyone's a spy. How did this happen? A story went around that Gage's wife, she was American, had leaked the plan. But this was never more than a rumor. The real problem, from Gage's point of view, was that almost everyone in Boston was a spy. Well, maybe not an official spy, but everyone in Boston had an angry eye on those hated British soldiers. One of the men who organized this American spy ring was a silversmith named Paul Revere. I was one of upwards of 30 who formed ourselves into a committee for the purpose of watching the movements of the British soldiers. People outside the city were also on the lookout. When General Gage first started thinking about sending his soldiers out to Concord, he realized that he would need to know more about the roads the army would have to take. He gave Colonel Francis Smith 
the job of secretly checking out the route. Smith took along a young private named John Howe. Smith and Howe dressed up like American laborers. You know, gray overcoat, leather pants, blue stockings. They took a couple of walking sticks and set off on the 17-mile hike to Concord. Smith didn't make it too far before getting hungry. He was a famously big eater. So the two men went into a roadside tavern, sat at a table, and ordered some breakfast. Pretending to be a regular old American in search of a job, Smith asked the waitress if she knew of any place where he and his friend might find some employment. But the woman, all we know about her is that she was African American, had spent a lot of time in Boston, and she knew the faces of the high-ranking British officers. Officers. She looked him in the eye and said, Smith, you will find employment enough for you and all Gage's men in a few months. Smith just about fell off his chair. He called the woman a saucy wench and promised to kill her if he ever saw her again. And then he ran home. The last I saw of Smith, he was running through barberry bushes to keep out of sight of the road, said Private Howe. You get the idea. The British couldn't make a move without everyone knowing about it. And by April 18, it was really, really obvious that something was going on in Boston. British officers were stopping by the stables, making sure their horses were ready to go, totally ignoring the lowly local kids who worked as stable boys. The officers bragged about the upcoming action. The stable boys passed the information on to Paul Revere. Another clue. The British repaired their small transport boats and launched them in the Charles River. These were the boats the British soldiers would use if they ever wanted to cross the river on their own to Lexington and Concord. As Revere noted, from these movements, we expected something serious was to be transacted. Trapped in Boston. So Revere and his fellow spies knew the British were about to do something serious. But what? It really wasn't that hard to guess. Everyone knew about the weapons in Concord, and everyone knew that King George wanted them destroyed. Everyone also knew that the king wanted John Hancock and Samuel Adams arrested. British soldiers made no secret of their hostile feelings for Hancock and Adams. One popular British marching chant went like this. You can sing along to the tune of a Yankee Doodle. As for their king, John Hancock and Adams, if they're taken, their heads for signs shall hang on high upon that hill called Beacon. It doesn't exactly rhyme, but you get the point. Hancock and Adams were wanted men. Anytime your head is hanging up as a sign, it's not good. On the night of April 18, British soldiers were gathered by the river. Revere and friends knew what they had to do. First, warn Hancock and Adams that British soldiers were on their way to arrest them. Second, alert the people of Concord that the British were coming to destroy the weapons stored there. Easier said than done. Boston was nearly surrounded by water, so to get out of the city, they had to either cross the Charles River or make it over the thin strip of land called Boston Neck. And of course, Gage knew that Revere and other express riders would try to get a warning out to Lexington and Concord. Gage issued strict orders to his men, let no one out of Boston tonight. He moved the warship, Somerset, into the river to block any exit by boat. He placed a string of soldiers across Boston Neck. It was only 60 yards wide. He even sent out groups of British soldier officers on horseback, pistols hidden under their coats, to patrol the road to Lexington and Concord. Two with by sea. There was a real chance that no one would be able to get out of Boston with a warning for the nearby towns. But don't worry, Revere and friends had a backup plan. They arranged to send a secret signal by lighting lanterns at the top of Old North Church in Boston. The lanterns would be visible across the Charles River in Char Charleston. This way, if no one could get out of Boston with the latest news, at least people in Charleston could begin spreading the alarm that the British were on their way. It was agreed that one lantern would mean the British were marching out by land over Boston Neck. Two lanterns would mean the British were coming by water over the Charles River. Yes, these are the one-if-by-land and two-if-by-sea lanterns from the famous Henry 
Wadsworth Longfellow poem. The guy who volunteered to hang the lanterns was a young sexton at the Old North Church, Robert Newman. A sexton cleans up the place, rings the church bells, stuff like that. Newman didn't like the job, but he kept it. He said, because times are so hard. Now it was just before 10 o'clock and Newman was ready for action. The first thing he did was say goodnight to his mom. And not just because he was a good son. British officers were renting rooms in the family house. And at this moment, they were sitting around playing cards in the living room. Newman wanted the officers to think he was going to bed for the evening. In fact, he went up to his room, climbed out the window, climbed over the roof, and jumped down into the dark shadows in front of the church. Revere found Newman there a little after 10 o'clock. Maybe Revere held up two fingers to silently show Newman that the British were moving out by water. This was clear by now, since the British soldiers were already gathering by the river. Newman knew what to do. He used his keys to unlock the church doors. He took two lanterns from the closet, climbed the stairs to the top of the bell tower, and lit the lanterns, but only for a moment. He didn't want the signal to be spotted by anyone on the warship, Somerset, which was clearly visible in the water below. Then Newman went down the stairs, put the lanterns back, leapt out a window in the back of the church, climbed up and over the roof of his mother's house, dropped in through the window of his bedroom, and lay down in bed. You think he slept that night? Across the river. As soon as Paul Revere left Robert Newman at the church door, he ran home to get his riding boots. Revere's mission was to row across the Charles River, if possible, and then ride out to Lexington with the warning. By now, the streets were filled with British soldiers, armed for battle, marching toward their meeting point at the river. Avoiding the soldiers, Revere hustled from his house down to a spot on the water where he had a small rowboat hidden. Two friends were waiting for Revere by the boat. They had agreed to row him across the river. But now that Revere and his friends looked out at the, char at the Charles, they realized that they had a problem. The Somerset, which is 64 guns, with its 64 guns, was sitting out there, keeping watch on the water. And just Revere's luck, it was a clear night with a big bright moon. To have a chance, they would have to be absolutely silent. Have you ever been in a rowboat? They make a lot of noise. The oars are held in place by metal oar locks, which clank and squeak as the oars are pulled. To muffle this sound, Revere would need some cloth to wrap around the oar locks. No one had thought of this ahead of time. Luckily, one of Revere's friends had a girlfriend who lived on a nearby street. They rushed to her house. The guy gave a whistle outside his girl's window. She came to the window. He whispered for her to throw down some cloth. She quickly slipped off her flannel petticoat, a kind of slip worn under a dress, and tossed it down. Revere and his friends ripped up the petticoat, wrapped it around the oar locks, and rowed right across the river without being heard or seen by sailors on the Somerset. Revere and that other guy. A few pals were waiting for Revere on the Charleston shore. They told him that they had seen the lanterns just fine and had already started spreading the news. They warned him that British officers were out patrolling the roads. Then they gave him a fast horse and watched him set off on the most famous horseback ride in American history. It was then, about 11 o'clock, Revere remembered. He knew that Revere's first goal was to get to Lexington to warn Adams and Hancock. On the way there, he warned people in houses along the road. Most people think that Revere shouted, The British are coming! The British are coming! But what he probably said was, The regulars are out! The regulars are out! By regulars, he meant British soldiers. He really should have said, The British are coming. It sounds better. Oh well, too late now. Paul Revere gets all the press. But meanwhile, a second express rider was also out that night. He was a 23-year-old shoemaker named Billy Dawes. This was another part of Revere's backup plan. If he got caught, maybe Dawes would get through with the warning. To get out of Boston, Dawes first had to find a way past the British soldiers guarding Boston Neck. He was the perfect man for this risky job. 
He was the kind of guy who liked to sneak in and out of Boston, pretending to be a drunken farmer just for laughs. So he made it out on the night of April 18th. Like Revere, he set out for Lexington. We'll catch up with him in a minute. <clears throat> the Midnight Intruder. Now let's check in on Samuel Adams and John Hancock, two guys who have done so much to cause all this trouble. Adams and Hancock Adams and Hancock were staying at the home of Reverend Jonas Clark in Lexington. It was a full house at the Clark's place. In addition to Adams, Hancock, and the Clark family, 14 of them, you also had Hancock's Aunt L Lydia, his fiance Dorothy Quincy, and his clerk, John Lowell. It was just after midnight and everyone had gone to bed. The big house was dark and quiet. A Lexington Minuteman named William Monroe stood guard outside the house, just in case. Suddenly, a horse charged up and a man jumped off. He demanded to be let into the Clark's home, but Monroe didn't know this excited writer, and he asked him to keep his voice down. I told him the family had just retired and had requested that they might not be disturbed by any noise about the house. Monroe later said, Noise! shouted the stranger. You'll have noise enough before long. The regulars are coming. The man pushed past Monroe and started pounding on the front door. Several windows opened upstairs. The several heads stuck out to investigate the disturbance. One of the heads, in a silk nightcap, belonged to John Hancock. He looked down at the door, recognized the intruder, and said, Come in, Revere. We are not afraid of you. Paul Revere was let in, and everyone came downstairs to hear the news. Hancock immediately began pacing in his nightshirt, demanding his sword and gun, insisting that he was going out into Lexington Common to fight the British. He was probably trying to impress Dorothy. Samuel Adams, however, pretended to get out of town, preferred to get out of town. He reminded Hancock that the two of them were members of the Continental Congress. Politicians, in other words, not soldiers. That was his polite way of telling Hancock that he was acting like a fool, but Hancock continued to insist that he would stand and fight. While Adams and Hancock are arguing this point, we'll check the progress of the British soldiers. Where were they, anyway? According to Gage's plan, they should have been here by now. Where are the British? Gage's whole plan was based on timing. He wanted his soldiers to hit Concord before dawn, before the Minutemen had a chance to gather in large numbers. Gage's first mistake was putting Colonel Francis Smith in command of the expedition. Smith was a slow-moving man, one of those people who's always late. You'll remember that Gage ordered Smith to have his soldiers assembled by the boats at exactly 10 o'clock. Well, the men were there, but Smith wasn't. When he finally showed up, about 700 soldiers were standing around, wondering what they were supposed to be doing. From this point on, everything moved much too slowly. It took two trips to get all the soldiers across the Charles River. Once they were on the other side, the men stood around waiting some more. Lieutenant John Barker remembered, We were halted in a dirty road and stood there till two o'clock in the morning, waiting for provisions to be brought from the boats and to be divided. This was a total waste of time, since most of the men had brought their own food. As soon as they got their share of army food, they threw it on the ground. So four hours were gone already, and the British had traveled about a quarter of a mile. Not a good start. At least they were on their way now, marching toward Lexington in the bright moonlight. On to Concord. And speaking of Lexington, Billy Dawes arrived at the Clark's house while we were checking on the British. Don't blame him for getting there half an hour after Revere. His route was longer. While Dawes and Revere had a quick snack, you have to eat, even in the middle of famous historical events, Captain John Parker got the Lexington Minutemen together on the town common. They had their guns. They were all ready to, they were ready to defend their town. The only problem was that there was nothing to do. The British were nowhere in sight. It was a cold night. Parker couldn't keep his men standing out there forever, so he let the men go, but told them to listen for William Diamond beating his drum. This was the signal for the Minutemen to come running back to Lexington Common. Some of the men went home. Others walked across the common to Buckman's Tavern. 
where they waited with a drink by the warm fire. At about 1 a.m., Revere and Dawes left the Clark's house, riding on very tired horses. They started down the road toward Concord. They still had to warn the people that there that, well, you know what. On their way out of Lexington, they met up with Samuel Prescott, a young doctor from Concord. Prescott was heading home from his fiancée Lydia's house. He offered to help spread the alarm with Revere and Dawes. The three of them set off. Now, remember those armed British officers that General Gage sent out to patrol the roads? They're about to make a sudden appearance. Captured. On the way to Concord, Prescott and Dawes stopped to warn people in a house beside the road. Revere rode up ahead a bit just to check out the path. He spotted two British officers hiding in the shadows of a tree. They spotted him too. Then a lot of things happened very quickly. Revere shouted a warning to Prescott and Dawes. A few more British officers charged out from the shadows, pointing their pistols and shouting, If you go an inch further, you are a dead man. This didn't stop anyone. Revere, Prescott, and Dawes all dashed off in different directions. Prescott jumped his horse over a stone wall and raced down the wall road. Dawes tried to trick the British by pretending to be one of them. Hello, boys, I've got two of them, he yelled, galloping his horse toward the woods. But then, for some reason, he fell off. He scrambled to his feet and darted into the dark woods on foot. Dawes' watch flew out of his pocket when he fell from his horse. A few days later, when the coast was clear, he came back and found it. Revere also raced his horse toward the woods, but he rode right to a spot where six more British officers were hiding. They stepped out of the shadows, held their guns on Revere, and started questioning him. British officer, sir, may I ha crave your name? Revere. My name is Revere. British officer. What? Paul Revere? Revere. Yes. These guys knew who Paul Revere was, and they had a good idea of what he had been doing. Revere never forgot what happened next. One of them clapped his pistol to my head, called me by my name, and told me he was going to ask me some questions, and if I did not give him true answers, he would blow my brains out. Revere admitted that he had been out warning people that the British army was on its way. The British cursed at him and kept threatening to shoot him, but they had to patrol the road, and they didn't want to worry about keeping an eye on him. So they took his horse and let him go. Revere stumbled through pastures and a graveyard on his way back to Lexington. Meanwhile, Dawes was somewhere in the woods without a horse. If anyone was going to get to Concord in time to warn the town, it would have to be Prescott. Good thing he had stayed so late at Lydia's. They haven't left yet? Revere made it back to the Reverend Clark's house in Lexington at about 3.30 in the morning. And guess what? Adams and Hancock were still there. With the British soldiers marching closer and closer, Hancock would not stop insisting that he was going to stay and fight. Dorothy Quincy recalled, Mr. Hancock was all night cleaning his gun and sword and was determined to go out to the plain by the meeting Hollis where the battle was to fight with the men who had collected. Finally, somehow, Adams convinced Hancock that they'd better get going. A carriage was prepared for their escape. Before Hancock climbed in, he had time for one last argument with his this time with his fiancée. Dorothy mentioned that she was going to go back to her father's house in Boston. Hancock objected. Mr. Hancock, no, madame, you shall not return as long as there is a British bayonet left in Boston, Miss Quincy. Recollect, Mr. Hancock, I am not under your authority yet. I shall go to my father's house tomorrow. Poor Adams must have been rolling his eyes in the back of the carriage. At least the argument was short. In a minute, Adams and Hancock made their escape. Dorothy wasn't sorry to see John's carriage drive away. At that time, I should have been very glad to have got rid of him, she said. She and her Aunt Lydia stayed behind at the Clark's house. Later, later that morning, from the second-story window, they watched the American Revolution begin. Beat that drum, Billy. Now it was a few minutes after 4 a.m. You know that cold gray light that comes just before sunrise? That's how it was in Lexington when the British army was finally spotted on the road outside town. They were a mile away and coming on fast. Captain Parker told 16-year-old William Diamond to start beating his drum. The Lexington Minutemen grabbed their guns and ran into town. <laughs>